Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. As always, I'm your host, Thomas, and I'm so grateful that you've tuned in. Tonight's story was written by Alicia, and I'll be reading it to you. The 1st of May has long been celebrated. For some, it has been a time to look ahead and hope for an abundant year. For others, it's marked because of its calendar date, located halfway between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. And thanks to the fact that May the 1st coincided with other historical events, it has become wrapped up with all sorts of celebratory traditions, both pagan and Christian. Tonight, we'll travel along with Nora, who starts her afternoon doing a simple dance around the maypole and ends up on a fantastic journey through history and across the European continent. By the time she finds herself back home again, she'll have a much better understanding of how May Day has evolved through the years. Don't forget that we always welcome your story ideas or any suggestions you might have for the show. You, our listeners, have given us some of our most creative and unique topics and themes so please do keep them coming. You can email me via the contact page on our website at getsleepy.com or feel free to message us on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter. Just search our handle, Get Sleepy Pod. So now, it's nearly time for tonight's story. But before we begin, just make sure you're as comfortable as can be, lying in a position that invites a sense of relaxation and coziness. Bring your attention right into the present moment, focusing on how your body feels as you rest here in bed. Starting at your head, feeling the soft support of the pillow below, scan down through your body, one section at a time. As you scan through, try to maintain an air of gratitude. Be thankful to each and every part of your body for the role it plays in keeping you alive and thriving. Be thankful too for the support of your comfy bed, giving each and every part of your body another opportunity to rest tonight. This is your time to slow down, to let go of tension and of the thoughts and worries of daily life. While you rest through the night, there is no reason to problem solve or to worry. It isn't helpful right now. So just take this opportunity to be grateful and accept the invitation of rest as you enjoy the comfort of your bed. It 
it's time to hear our story. So, in your imagination, picture a bright morning without a single cloud in the sky. May is finally here after a long winter, and you've awakened refreshed and ready for a lovely afternoon party. This is where our story begins. The first of May dawned bright and sunny. Although there was still a spring chill in the air, the birds were up with the sun, singing in full force. A light breeze ruffled the tender green leaves that were beginning to fill in the tree branches. When Nora opened her eyes, she knew it was going to be a splendid day. The fine weather was especially important because Nora had been invited to a garden party. Most years, the first of May came and went without much fuss. However, her friend Laurie had turned 13 the previous week. She had the marvelous idea to celebrate her birthday with a May Day themed outdoor party in her garden. The invitation had stipulated festive spring attire, fairies welcome. This mysterious dress code was delightfully nonspecific. It had given Nora the perfect excuse to wear her prettiest new dress, and she was planning to top it off with a delicate crown of flowers. The garden party was at lunchtime. Nora was impatient for the morning hours to pass. When it was finally time to leave for the party, she checked her reflection in the full-length mirror in the hallway. Her dress was full-skirted and covered in a delicate floral print. To keep her warm enough in the spring weather, Her mother had insisted on a pale green cardigan. She turned in a circle and watched the skirt float around her. Then her mother handed her Laurie's sweetly wrapped birthday gift. It was topped with a frothy pink bow. It was time to go. Nora's mother dropped her off at Laurie's front door with a wave, promising to pick her up later in the afternoon. Standing at the end of the path to Laurie's house, Nora admired the beautifully decorated front door, which was decked with boughs of yellow flowers. She approached the house rang the doorbell, and stood expectantly on the doorstep. Laurie opened the door and beamed at Nora. The birthday girl was dressed from head to toe like a magical sprite. 
Her dress was almost like a ballerina costume, sky blue, with a fluffy tulle skirt. Her hair was styled with elaborate braids and piled on her head, decorated with a sparkly little crown. She clapped delightedly at the sight of her friend, and then turned to show her costume from the back, where two gauze wings hung from her shoulders. She was all ready to be the fairy queen of her birthday party. Taking Nora's hand, Laurie pulled her excitedly through the house, stopping to show her where to leave her gift. When they emerged in the backyard, Nora was open-mouthed at the beautiful scene. They walked through a gorgeously decorated floral bower and she found herself standing in front of a tent that sheltered a lavish buffet. Tiny tea sandwiches were neatly arranged on large platters. Carafes of sparkling juices glowed ruby red and lemony yellow in the sunlight. Laurie's mother had also put out her fine china for the occasion. It was carefully stacked at the end of the table, with its traditional blue pattern. Little silver forks and spoons were arranged nearby. Best of all, instead of a single cake, there was a tower of elegant pastries. Nora could see small cupcakes, delicate pastel cookies, and adorable tarts in frilly paper cups. Despite her punctuality, Nora was not the very first person to arrive. A few other friends from school were milling about the yard in various interpretations of party dress, chatting and eyeing the lunch table. But very best of all, right in the middle of the garden, there was a tall maypole. A floral arrangement adorned to the top and it had long, silky ribbons hanging from it in a riot of colors. Pink, yellow, blue, green, and white. Nora had never actually danced around a maypole, and she was curious to find out how it worked. The luncheon buffet was soon being served. Time passed quickly and pleasantly at the party. Gifts were opened, and before Nora knew it, Laurie's mother was gathering the guests around the maypole and explaining how the dance would work. Nora could tell that Laurie had practiced beforehand. Queen of the proceedings, she stood confidently, holding a bright pink ribbon in her hand. With her mother's help, she demonstrated how half of the guests would go in each direction around the pole, weaving in and out. If they did their dance correctly, the pole would be braided in a consistent pattern by the time they ran out of ribbon. All 
the children stood around expectantly, making humorous faces at each other. When the music started, Nora began moving in the direction assigned to her. There was some confusion as a few guests got off on the wrong foot, but they were soon laughing with delight as they correctly navigated the dance, slowly braiding their silken ribbons around the pole. As Nora became more confident, she skipped more exuberantly, letting the ribbon fly up and down as she went in and out. The breeze was cool on her warm face as she gathered speed and relaxed into the pattern. There was a lot of calling out as a child here or there made a mistake, but Nora was flying effortlessly through the moment, relishing the sunshine on her face and the music in the air. At that moment, something a little strange happened. The entire party scene faded away, and she felt like time stood still. The sunshine and the wind were still there, but she felt like she had gone somewhere, as if the earth had shifted smoothly under her feet, and the scenery had changed. She stopped to get her bearings. When she lifted her head, she couldn't believe her eyes. Nora was no longer in Laurie's garden. Instead, she was standing in a bustling street. Everywhere she looked, There were people wearing colorful, draped robes. They were bartering, talking, laughing, and riding horses. Although she stood out among them in her frilly party dress, nobody seemed to see her. It's very festive, isn't it? said a female voice behind her. Nora turned to look at a statuesque woman with a crown of wildflowers on her head. She too was clad in the colorful, draped fabric Nora had observed on everyone else. Unlike everyone else, however, she appeared to actually see Nora. Where am I? Nora asked in confusion. The woman gestured widely to the scene in front of them. Why, you are in Rome, of course. Looking around again, Nora examined the style of the clothing and the classical architecture of the buildings. She realized it was as if she had stepped inside a picture in one of her history school books. Turning back to the woman, Nora had another question. And who are you? she asked. Smiling magnanimously, the mysterious lady said, Well, I'm Flora, of course, the goddess of flowers. Nora considered the festive wreath on her head and her elegant dress 
and nodded. This made perfect sense. The woman pointed to a small building not far away. It had a peaked triangular roof that was supported by several pillars in front of it. That's my temple over there. You are very fortunate to be in Rome during the festival of Floralia. Nora took all this information in and turned to watch a chariot drive by. The driver was finely attired and important looking, and the horse ran with an elegant gait. As the chariot disappeared into the crowd, leaving a cloud of dust, she asked, What's the festival for? Flora nodded, as if this were a very normal question. Well, it's a wonderful reason to give everyone several days of feasting and celebrations. It's especially in honor of a fertile year to come. Spring is, after all, when the new year of life begins. It's so much fun that it goes on for six days, and you've arrived in the middle of it. Nora looked around her, impressed. People of all walks of life appeared to be enjoying themselves immensely. Not far away, some sort of theatrical performance was happening on a large wooden stage. The players were gesturing dramatically, and the onlookers were smiling. From the laughing of the crowd, It appeared to be a comedy. Flora pointed to a massive structure straight ahead and said the center of the activity is the Circus Maximus. Nora looked more closely at the enormous building. It was oval in shape and appeared to be an open-air theatre of some type. People were streaming in and out of the entrances in large numbers, as if some were leaving an event and others were arriving for the next one. Outside, under the stands, The ground level around the perimeter of the stadium was lined with columns. In the open arches of the columns, she could see lots of activity. It looked like perhaps there were shops there. There was so much going on that she hardly knew what to look at first. Just then, a cheer arose from inside the forum. Flora noticed Nora's look of surprise and explained. There are many different types of entertainments that take place inside the Circus Maximus during the days of Floralia. For example, Right now, they are having horse races. If you can imagine, up to 150,000 people can fit in there. Nora raised her eyebrows in disbelief. It was true 
the stadium was much larger than any she had ever seen before. Is it just wealthy people? she asked. Flora shook her head and smiled. All are welcome at the festival of Floralia. Then she added, although it's true that not everyone gets to sit in the best seats. Nora nodded as if she understood. That didn't sound so different from what she'd experienced. When she had been to the theatre with her parents, they were often sitting very far in the back. The goddess started slowly walking, and Nora followed to hear what else she had to say. If you were to stay until night time, she told Nora, you would see many people going to banquets and theatrical shows. They light torches and celebrate all night. There are six entire days of games. One year, there was even a tightrope-walking elephant. At this, Nora clapped her hand lightly over her mouth, amazed. The two of them stopped to watch a performance of mimes. A small crowd of people had gathered around them. These revelers were wearing humble clothing that looked more ordinary than the fine togas of some of the other people milling about. However, they didn't seem to feel out of place and were laughing and enjoying the show. While she stood there, some exuberant people danced by, throwing small beans at everyone. Flora put her hand up as if to ward off the rain of legumes. What is that for? Nora asked. Well, it's to symbolize fertility, of course, Flora responded laughing. In order to encourage my blessing, there will be a bundle of wheat brought to my temple on May the 3rd. Then Flora added, somewhat conspiratorially, I would give them my blessing anyway, but it's nice to be noticed. Nora chuckled at this, She had never imagined goddesses to be so approachable. Another cheer emanated from the Circus Maximus. Nora motioned to the busy scene, saying, And to think, all we do for the first of May is dance around a pole for one day. Flora smiled. You know, she said, there are actually some old-fashioned maypoles around here, too. Nora scanned the street. She didn't see any. Noticing her confusion, Flora added, they are more likely to be found out in the country. People sometimes take the leaves and branches off of a tree and decorate it with flowers and ivy. Flora gazed at the Circus Maximus as if reflecting upon its grand scale. Then she turned her head to Nora 
and said, I think you've seen enough of Floralia for one day. Most of the nighttime celebrations will be for the grown-ups. Shall I send you on your way? Nora was taken aback. Send me on my way? Where am I going? Flora looked at her kindly and put a hand on her shoulder. Then she said, You'll see. Close your eyes and don't open them until I say so. Within moments, the cheering, the clip-clop of horses' hooves, and the laughter of the clouds was receding. Nora obediently kept her eyes shut tightly, even as she felt the spring air blow colder around her. She was standing surrounded by silence when she felt the hand leave her shoulder, and a gentle voice said, You can open your eyes now. The scenery around Nora had completely changed. It was very dark now, and she was standing on a hill, looking down upon a medieval city. Turning to look at her companion, she saw that the woman was no longer the goddess Flora. Instead, a nun was gazing upon her, smiling serenely. Nora asked the woman where they were. You are in Eichstätt in Bavaria, she said calmly. Sensing Nora's confusion, she continued. I am Valperga. I am now considered to be a saint, but I was once an abbess in the 8th century. I studied medicine in England, where I was born, and became a Christian missionary here in Germany. I developed the monastery here into a center for education and culture. Nora was impressed by this story. She regarded the soberly attired woman before her. But what did you do to become a saint? Valperga nodded as if she expected this question. A lot of people believe that I have healing powers. This made a lot of sense to Nora but she still had questions. What does this have to do with May Day? Volperga shrugged. The date of my canonization as a saint happened to be May the 1st. People were already lighting bonfires the night before May 1st as a symbolic protection from witchcraft. Somehow, my identity became linked to the fires, and now there is a traditional belief that I can also ward off witchcraft. Now, St. Valpurgis Night is celebrated in many countries on the evening of April the 30th, although the traditions vary. Nora rubbed her arms. She was feeling a bit chilly. 
it was as if Valperga could read her thoughts. She said, it's quite cool, and there's not much to see here at the moment, is there? Come with me. I'll show you where some of the festivities are underway. Obediently, Nora accepted her hand and followed her a few steps into the dark. They had walked only a short distance when they saw a blazing bonfire up ahead. There were people around the fire singing songs. The red and orange flames danced wildly, casting a flickering light on all the people standing around. Some children were holding green branches. Nora overheard one of them being praised by a parent, who said that will be perfect to decorate the house. Nora turned to look at Valperga, who was smiling at the fellowship around the fire. This is one of the simpler traditions, she said. In later years, in other countries, the celebration becomes far more elaborate. This made Nora curious to hear more. She tilted her head inquisitively and waited for Valperga to continue. Finland is an excellent place to be for Valpurgis, she added. In fact, I hope it's not prideful for me to tell you that Valpurgis is one of the four most important festivals of the year there. Nora raised her eyebrows, impressed. The nun folded her hands into her robes and continued. The event begins with elaborate carnivals on the night of April the 30th. In the morning, fancy picnics are set up in public places, and the celebrations continue with lovely food and drinks. Groups of friends fill the public parks, laying grand picnics. Under the blossoming trees, they feast, often on white tablecloths and with candelabras and fine dinnerware. Then the nun said, rather sternly, Of course, I don't concern myself with these lavish things. But she added, students are especially prone to take part in these festivities, and some of them do get up to mischievous hijinks in honor of the holiday. But it's all in good fun. Nora was delighted by the picture in her mind, and was eager to hear more. Valperga continued. In the Czech Republic, it is traditional to search for a blossoming cherry tree, and to kiss a lady underneath it at midnight. Valperga pretended not to be surprised that Nora was looking scandalized. She continued, I'm just telling you about the traditions. I didn't create them. 
Nora giggled. She liked this very candid nun. The two of them stood quietly for a moment, enjoying the crackling bonfire and the strains of the lovely choral singing from the crowd. The sparks rising into the darkness were mesmerizing, and Nora found herself sinking into a mild trance. Then, Valperga turned to Nora and said, Valpurgis has a lot in common with the tradition of Beltane. Did you know that? Nora furrowed her brow and shook her head. She had not heard of this other holiday. The nun nodded, smiling, and placed her hand on Nora's shoulder, telling her to close her eyes, as Flora had done. Knowing what was coming next, Nora gladly complied, holding her breath a little with anticipation. As she did, the loud crackling of the bonfire faded. The singing voices of the revelers appeared to drop away one by one. Even with her eyes closed, she sensed the inky darkness around the bonfire lifting, as if the sky were lightening around her. The last thing she noticed was the sound of cows lowing nearby. Then she heard the bleating of a goat quite near to her, and, without thinking, she opened her eyes. Nora was surprised to find herself standing in a farmyard. The animal noise was coming from a white goat that was stood a few feet away. Behind her, she could see a simple stone building with a gabled, thatched roof. The windows and door were both decorated with yellow flowers. Nora noticed that the lowing of the cow was coming from inside the building. It occurred to her from her history lessons that this house might be a buyer, which meant the people and animals were under the same roof. Turning in a circle, Nora could see rolling green pastures in every direction, dotted with a few similar dwellings. Has the neighbor got smoke coming from his chimney yet? This strange question, in a dulcet tone, came from someone now standing in the door of the cottage. It was a girl about her age, dressed in a homespun skirt and blouse. Smiling, as if it were not at all strange to find Nora on her land, she pointed at one of the nearby houses. There was a small curl of smoke emanating from its chimney. Mother is very superstitious, the girl said. At dawn during Beltane, she doesn't like to light our fire until the neighbor's fire has been lit first. 
Without waiting for Nora to react, the girl skipped towards her with some excitement. Of course, she continued, there will be lots of fires soon. Grand bonfires will be lit on the hillside so that the farmers can drive their cattle between them. It's meant to give them protection from misfortune as they head out to summer pasture, she explained. Undeterred by Nora's silence, she went on. And then everyone will douse all their household fires, of course, and relight them from the Beltane bonfires. Winking, she added, one can never be too careful, right? Nora nodded emphatically. She certainly could not disagree with such a philosophy. The girl accepted this as sufficient. I'm Fiona, she offered matter-of-factly. Then she held out her hand, revealing three pieces of coal. Nodding to the side of the house, she said, I have to put these under the butter churn. It keeps the fairies from stealing our butter. Mother normally keeps the churn in the kitchen, but she was scrubbing it this morning. Then she motioned to the floral bough over the door frame. And that there should keep the fairy folk out of the milking pail as well. Normally, we send some milk over to our neighbor in the morning, but it's bad luck on Beltane. Lowering her voice, she added, You might find your cow's milk transferred to the neighbor's cow if you do. Nora followed Fiona to the newly scrubbed butter churn and watched her wedge the coal pieces underneath it. Having finished this task, Fiona peered at her own dirty hands and wrinkled her nose. I'm going to go and wipe these on the wet grass. I can't very well show up at the celebrations like this, can I? Laughing at her own joke, Fiona tripped across the farmyard to the nearby grass and began wiping her hands there. As Nora followed, Fiona looked over her shoulder and said, Did you get some of the dew this morning? Nora was perplexed. Dew? she asked questioningly. Fiona stood and put her freshly wiped hands on her hips and made a sceptical face. Did you miss the chance to take some of the Beltane dew from the grass and put it on your face? Then, as if passing on a secret, she leaned in and lowered her voice, saying, All the girls know that it's likely to increase your beauty. If you want to catch anyone's eye at the feast, it can't hurt. Nora looked at the grass doubtfully. Then she peered down at her frilly party dress. She thought she would look quite out of place here at a Beltane feast. Just then, a woman called Fiona's name from inside the house. Fiona looked at the doorway 
and as if a clock had struck the hour, she appeared to realize it was time to go. Nodding at Nora, as if it were the most expected thing in the world, Fiona said, Time to go then. You'll want to be off. If you'll close your eyes for a few moments, you'll find yourself where you need to be. Quite used to this routine by now, Nora did so without delay. Again, the early May breeze blew lightly around her. Just for a moment, she soaked up the smell of the fresh green grass and the straw scent of the farm. The goat bleated again somewhere nearby. Then she sensed that Fiona and her thatched buyer had disappeared. She waited patiently to find out where she would end up next. The first thing Nora noticed was the sound of cheerful fiddling. As she stood, trying to keep her eyes closed for a few more seconds, she became aware of the low murmur of a crowd as well. She sensed she must be surrounded by a lot of people. Slowly opening her eyes, she saw that she was standing on a village green in the middle of a party. It still seemed like early morning, but festivities were in full swing, as if they'd been going on for hours. Looking around her, she saw revelers talking, laughing, and eating. Kalan Mai is quite a scene, isn't it? said a woman's voice behind her. Turning around, Nora saw a very pretty, young-looking lady. She had a beautiful wreath of dainty flowers on her head, and her hair was very long and lovely. As if noticing Nora's scrutiny of her headwear, the woman reached up and adjusted her crown. Yes, I'm the May Queen, she explained. It's quite an honor. Last night, as they do every year, two men dressed up to represent winter and summer They battled in a mock fight, and of course, Summer won. Lowering her voice and leaning in slightly, she said, He always does, naturally. Then the man representing Summer chooses a May Queen and a King, and I was the lucky one. Nora thought this was very modest, considering the great honor. She imagined it must have made her very proud to win over the many other ladies at the village green. Nora's conversation with the May Queen was interrupted by loud caroling nearby. A group of singers were serenading people at their doorsteps, 
many of which were decked with boughs of hawthorn. In each case, they were being warmly welcomed, and they were rewarded with food. Nora and the May Queen stood watching them. They had their own harpist walking around with them, and they were quite good. Nora's attention was drawn next to a group of people who had started a dance to the fiddler's music. They were moving in pairs, and the ladies had colorful ribbons in their hands. Forward and backward, in and out, and circling around their partners, the dancers gaily stepped to the music without making a mistake. Onlookers clapped in time and shouted out encouragement and jokes. The May Queen shook her head at the dancers with a sigh. I must admit, I'm rather tired. Everyone's been celebrating since the fires were lit last night. Most of them haven't been home to their beds. Nora thought for a moment that she could understand how they must be feeling. She was getting pretty tired after her long trip visiting all these strange places. She had to admit, however, that Kalan Mai seemed to be an awful lot of fun. It was certainly more raucous than Laurie's garden party. As this thought crossed her mind, Nora realized that despite all these interesting celebrations, she might like to be back home. She turned to the May Queen and asked her if she might be able to help return her to her maypole in the garden. After all, these women of May Day all seemed somehow to be able to send her onward. Smiling sweetly, the May Queen nodded. Then putting her hand on Nora's shoulder, she said, You've been to quite a lot of places for one May Day, haven't you? Nora nodded. She was glad the lady understood. All right then, the pretty Queen of May agreed. Just close your eyes, and I think I can help you land back where you started. As Nora followed her instructions, the lady added, Or, as you can see from your journey, your May Day garden party is less about the start and more about the destination, isn't it? Although she already felt the village green fading away, Nora realized that was true. She had discovered that her dance around the maypole was a tiny remnant of all the May Day traditions that had come before it. Then the spirited fiddler's music was gone and she once again heard the tune that had been playing in Laurie's backyard. 
she felt her feet moving underneath her, and the ribbons moving over her. And Nora opened her eyes to discover that she had not missed a beat. She'd been around the world, sailed through time, and woven her ribbons exactly right, from Floralia to Kalan Mai, and back to the Maypole. That night, with the party long over, Nora sank gratefully into her soft and cozy bed at home. She couldn't remember when she'd been this tired. Her mother had left her window cracked just enough to let in the early May breezes, but to keep out the late spring chill. Sighing deeply, Nora leaned her head back into her pillow and gazed at the floral wallpaper in her bedroom. She didn't normally think much about it, but now the sprigs of little buds that decorated her walls took on a new meaning. They made her think fondly of Flora and the May Queen. They brought to mind the doors of cottages, cheerfully defending their inhabitants from unruly fairies. They meant that winter had given way to summer, and that the cows would return to the abundance of the pastures. Rolling over, she pulled the covers up around her shoulders and closed her eyes. And as she drifted off to sleep, she saw brightly colored ribbons weaving in and out, in and out. And she was faintly aware of the distant strains of a harp and a fiddle floating on the breeze.